Hi everyone, welcome to our event. This event is brought to you by Data Talks Club, which is a community of people who love data. We have weekly events. This is one of such events. If you want to find out more about the events we have, there is the link in the description. Check it out. You'll find many interesting events. So next week we will actually have like three or four, three I think events. Um, I don't think all of them are announced, by, but keep an eye on them. And the reason we have more than one weekly event, it's actually like free, is because in July we will not have any events at all. So I'm kind of piling them up so then we can release them um, separately. Mm. Anyways, um, yeah, if you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, now it's the best time to do this. There's this red button below the video. Click on this and you will get notified about all our videos. And we have an amazing Slack community where you can uh, talk to other data enthusiasts. During today's interview, you can ask any question you want. There is a link in the live chat. So click on this link, ask your questions, and I will be covering these questions during the interview. So this week, we'll talk about data science for social impact. And we have a special guest today, Christine. Christine is a writer and researcher of tech and social issues. She's currently studying data science for public policy, and previously she spent years managing social programs and exploring data science for social good. Welcome, Christine. Hi, so happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, before we go into our main topic of data science for social impact, let's start with your background. Can you tell us about your career journey so far? Sure, absolutely. So uh, for me, I started uh, wanting to really figure out how to serve marginalized communities. So I studied political economy and sustainable development in my undergrad. And then for the next four years, I worked as a program manager for sustainability initiatives. And then after that, I sort of became fascinated with data or I saw how powerful it was in those roles. So I made sort of a pivot into working as a data analytics person in the private sector for over four years. Um, and at that point, um, I, I needed, my goal was always to bring those things together. And that's what I'm doing now in Berlin. Um, I came here for a graduate program. Uh, called, it's called Data Science for Public Policy. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, what do program managers do? Yes, a uh, great question. So in the social impact space, you're definitely managing uh, different initiatives. So for example, I was a, a, a program manager at um, actually at a corporation for doing their sustainability and corporate social responsibility. So I was the I want to say like king, but that's not <laughs> the queen of queen. several initiatives that I took ownership of. And um, so we had sustainability reporting, things like that, that I mm -hmm. manage. Mm -hmm. And by managing here, you make sure that things uh, get done? Or? Yeah, so it's it's a little bit more than a project management. Um, I think the main difference is, um, is that you not only become the face behind the cause, like these are definitely not, uh, these are initiatives which don't have an end. There's, there's no end. Um, so, for example, the sustainability reporting, like that organization hopes to do that forever. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a lot of like long term stakeholder relationship development um, in managing large data sets. And but yes, ultimately, you need to make sure mm -hmm. to drive the situation forward. So a program is a, ge a general direction and then projects would be individual Temporary. things, steps that you yes. need to move to this direction. Yes, something with a, a known end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what is, uh, you said you worked uh, as a data analyst in private sector. So what, what is it? What is private sector? Yeah. So private sector is um, any organization which um, does not have, like, I think, uh, social benefits. I think that's one way to say it. So it's just corporations, businesses. So, for example, I worked at Toyota, Wells Fargo, uh, mm -hmm. Blue Cross Blue Shield, which is the largest health insurer in the US. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So basically just the companies, right? Yep, exactly. Yeah, private, yeah. So the opposite would be public sector, right? Which yes. are governmental uh, institutions, right? Exactly, yes. Okay. 
Yeah, so you were a program manager, then you like data and you decided to go more into data. You became a data analyst and then you moved to Berlin to study data science for public policy, right? Genau. Genau, okay. <laughs> for those who don't speak German, you said exactly, right? Yes, exactly. Okay, how's your German? It's coming along. I'm trying. That's <laughs> okay. <I can. laughs> so, so you are studying data science for public policy, and I was wondering what actually a public policy. What is it? Sure, absolutely. So, uh, public policy is essentially um, it, it just, it's describing all of the the laws which you know govern govern people and places, um, and it's important in relation to social issues because it is the way that many social issues are addressed. Um, yeah, many social issues obviously, um, you know, have taken a government intervention to address. So for example, like public libraries, you know, like wouldn't have happened on its own, requires funding and support um, and space, things like that. So policies uh, are the way that you get things done at that higher level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a, po a policy would be like we need, um, like for every, I don't know, 1,000 people, we need to have at least one library. Something, Something like, like that. This. Yes. Okay. I'm not actually aware of library, <laughs> any library laws, but that would be a good example. I can give other real examples, but yes, um, ensuring yeah, public welfare. Mm -hmm. What are the examples you have in mind? Sure, yes. So something that I worked on um, specifically in the States um, was environmental legislation regarding electronics recycling. So this was something that companies did not want to do, like companies like HP, people that basically create like printers or monitors or things like that. Essentially, there was no easy way to recycle recycle these at the end of their life. Um, and so people would throw them away. Um, nine times out of 10, they would end up on a ship for a developing country where children would break them down and be exposed to toxic chemicals. Um, so there's just, there's a lot, there was a lot that was problematic with that situation and the companies were not willing to create a new way for people to easily rid this, rid their, rid themselves of these products in a sustainable way. And so um, I worked as a grassroots organizer uh, with a nonprofit to canvas neighborhoods, gather community support to petition lawmakers to eventually pass a law which required them to take back um, those products. Um, and so mm -hmm. they put, um, stations in every electronic store where people could bring and they would actually check they were recycled in a sustainable way. So, yeah. So the companies uh, do not have enough motivation to do this on their own. So they need an extra nudge coming from the government saying, hey, you actually must uh, give people a way to recycle products exactly. to come up with a law. And you yes. were kind of driving the driving force, or like you did this as a program manager, right? No, this was or as actually. A data analyst. Uh, this is or actually was... before that. This is um, I I uh -huh. did this as a community organizer. So yes, there's mm -hmm. lots of stuff in between and <laughs> and exploring social issues. But yes, I was a community organizer. So I knocked on doors actually and like mm -hmm. gathered signatures and donations, and then we mm -hmm. yeah brought everything to the capital. Yep. yep. You must be quite persuasive for this, or it's easy to persuade people that that this thing is bad, this thing is good. Give me your signature. Yeah, you know, actually, I've I've worked for over ten years, and seriously, that is still the hardest job I have ever done. And mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it's yeah, it's not easy because you knock on their door, they've ne they don't know you, they never seen you, they never heard of this issue, and now you want money. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And you want them to sig write a signature, or print out some letters. And so, I mean, people are doing this work. Community organizers are doing this everywhere. It's mm -hmm. just the hardest work I've ever done. <laughs> yeah. But I guess they don't have to give you any money, right? So all they, they need don't. to do is give you a signature. Yeah, both are both are definitely equally as important. Um, the letter is what gets this issue noticed by mm -hmm. our representatives, but the money definitely helps like facilitate all of that activity, mm -hmm. like going to the Capitol mm -hmm. all this time. So, so yes, that's, um, mm -hmm. 
So you were a volunteer, but somehow still needed to get paid, right? Oh, Or no, I worked, the I worked there. Yeah, so uh -huh, I, it was okay. my job to do that. Um, but yes, the organization as a whole needed, obviously, funds to mm -hmm. operate. So we would mm -hmm. knock on doors for eight hours. Mm -hmm. And uh, this public policy, so I thought, uh, like, policy, like, maybe it's related to politics, political science. It's not, right? Or is it? It is. Uh, yes. It's, I would say like, um, like political science is just, it's like the study of the systems of governance um, and public policy is essentially how, like putting it into action, I guess. So um, yeah, I think that's a, one is, yeah, an application, I guess, more so maybe. It's a good way to say it. And uh, I think you partly answered that uh, previously. So I, I wanted to know like how public policies are related to social impact. And I think um, the example you gave is pretty, like I, I was able to understand that, okay, companies need to recycle the products they do not want. So how can we uh, encourage them or force them to, to do this, right? So this is the social impact is uh, the environment is uh, well, maybe doesn't get harm, right? So it doesn't, uh, you know, you don't have these chemicals that you mentioned, like people, children do not play with uh, printers. Right? Um, is this how it's related? Right? So you come up with policies to have the social impact? Absolutely, yes. I think um, social issues tend to just be really, really complex. Uh, and usually there's just multiple ways to address it. So I'd say, for example, in that situation, the bigger picture is like, how do we increase sustainability? How do we increase well-being? And this is like just one little part of that. Um, so, so yeah, that's um, exactly, exactly what you said. Yeah. <laughs> the, this data science for public policy. So I, to prepare for this interview, I googled it, so I found the program where you study, and I found a couple of other programs. I think there was one in the States, in Washington University, I think it was from Washington DC, and I saw a couple of other places. And then I also came across a book that is called, like it has exactly this name, Data Science mm -hmm. and Public Policy. But in general, as a discipline, like is it uh, mature? Are there, like apart from this book, are there textbooks, are there people who are seriously working on this? Of thinking like how can you, uh, I, don't know, I don't want to say Mary, but like how you can do data science for public policy? Sure. So my, my sense is that it's very new. So I started following this concept of data science for social good maybe five or six years ago. And at that time, obviously I was in the States, there was really only one program that I was aware of in the country it was at the University of Chicago they would have they had a fellowship actually it wasn't it wasn't an academic program where they would help technical or like uh, policy people to like bring these concepts together um, and actually the reason I ended up in Germany was because um, upon doing research this I'd done research for years like looking you know maybe I want how can I combine like what I want to work on and this was the first data science for public policy program I found and now I, yes like you said there are so many there are so many it feels like they're everywhere now <laughs> mm -hmm. but um, well, not so many like if you just look for programs uh, university programs in data science you'll find millions of them sure but for for public policy like specifically for public policy, maybe for social good and so on, there are more, but for this specific, uh, uh, you know, think public policy, there are not so many yet. Right, sure, yeah, I guess well, it's like, yeah. at least I wasn't able to find. <laughs> yeah, no you're, no, you're exactly right. It's probably still like less than 10, but that feels like a like huge <laughs> <laughs> amount when for years there was, there was nothing, um, so. And yeah, and I was, like as a data scientist, so I do data science at work. And uh, yeah, I'm usually dealing with things like, uh, so I worked at, at an internet company. So we, we like, I don't know, look at clicks and things like this and transactions. And uh, yeah, so we as data scientists deal with things like linear regression, logistic regression, like uh, 
classification, regression, and so on. So I was really curious, what are the cases, what are the use cases for public policy? So I checked this book that I talked about, Data Science for Public Policy, the table of content, and I saw that um, uh, there are chapters on transforming data, record linkage, exploratory data analysis, analysis cluster analysis, NLP. And to me, it looked like, okay, this is what I do. Like, does it mean I already know everything I need for uh, public policy or there are some nuances? Yeah, there are definitely nuances. So yes, I investigated this book as well. I know it's fairly new. Um, I, I don't know that it is, I would consider it the Bible or the, you know, the, the definer of the field at all. I, I do, just like you said, see that majority of the book is just a data science book. So I think that that's something that's really targeted towards policymakers or political scientists that want to explore this field. But I actually think um, the goal of uh, data science for public policy is more so data science for social impact. Um, and the field, um, I guess, why you specify public policy is that um, I think there are not only a lot of uh, tech uh, issues, ethical and challenging issues with technology that we are facing right now, that we need edu people actually educated in what data science is. I think that's really critical. But I think also we're getting to a point where every, every type of organization, including social impact organizations, will we'll need a data scientist to support them or help them make progress. Um, and so I think that's kind of the future as well. Um, and so a data scientist that has some knowledge of the landscape or the processes, um, that's very beneficial. Just my experience being in both spaces, they are completely different. Working for a company, working in social impact, government, academia, everything, it's, it's, it's so different. Um, so. Okay, so it's aimed at people who, uh, like you were a couple of years ago, before getting into data, the data world, uh, it's aimed at educating them what is data science, how it can be used, how it can bring social impact, right? So I actually, um, our, our program has quite a few folks that are, their background is technology and there are lots of folks that they are social scientists and myself, I'm like a mix of both. So I do think like there's space for everyone that wants to have a very specific impact. Um, I, I, I appreciate the specificity um, because social impact has so many layers. Um, and the school I go to, Herti, is actually, they're a school of governance. So all they teach is policy. So they're just, they're experts at that part. Um, and I, I tend to think that that method is one of the most important methods to accelerating change. So I do think people can come from different ends into this space um, and they just need a little bit of knowledge from both sides. So mm -hmm. I can give a few examples of how this has worked. Um, so for example, um, um, I, I am a organizer with Data Science for Social Good in Berlin, which is a great organization if folks want to learn more about this. Um, but we had a presenter come at our most recent meetup and they are supporting refugees that are traveling, that are making their way to the Southern coast of Europe um, by flying drones and then using that, that footage um, to identify boats in the water, which they can send aid to. So this is actually a really challenging issue. They used computer vision to identify the boats. I mean, they shared some photos with like, can you find the boats? And I'm like, no, no one could, no human could find these boats. <laughs> and so, you know, that's, it's just a really critical way that um, this organization can support people um, that would otherwise receive no support. So, um, yeah, and I think uh, there's so I know in Scandinavia they're using um, satellite imagery to identify all of the flat roofs so that they can assess opportunities for rooftop gardens or or things like that to increase sustainability and livability in cities. So I think um, the I think if you have a specific social cause that really speaks to you, resonates with you, there is probably a way that you can apply technology to scale up the support for this issue. So yeah, there's lots of examples, but 
yeah so mm -hmm. yeah so, so it can be policy should... related but yeah sorry mm -hmm. go ahead so usually there is uh, some social problem and then organizations like data science for social good and others they have a list of problems that they think should be addressed right and then they get people who know data science who know public policy who know like all these things you mentioned they try to put them together in one place and solve the problem right and this this university that you mentioned it kind of teaches how to oversee this process how to run this process right um they are more, they're more so um at this point teaching the subjects separately but there is mm -hmm. so much to learn about the policy process um economics policy analysis um having just finished my first year i feel like i've you know there's so much more to know <laughs> mm -hmm. um but but yes i think um da data science for social good berlin does have nonprofit partners with data issues that volunteers then help them support specifically so mm -hmm. yeah and uh, coming back to the book so in this book one of the chapters was not the usual uh, you know the usual regressor or usual uh, i don't know entity linking one of the chapters was about ethics and uh, how important is the problem problem of a ethical data science for public policy sure i think it's it's absolutely critical um i think it's you know it's generally critical for all data science mm -hmm. you know always hope you're doing ethical data science um but i think um the way that it relates differently for data science for social impact or public policy is that ultimately we hope that laws reflect our values they reflect um you know the society that we want to have so you know there are many things that are not illegal but they are unethical and so there's like a gap where we as policymakers ideally step in and try to close close that gap um so yes i'd say it's absolutely critical in in helping these social impact causes and organizations build a strong foundation in data science but i also just think that um we were, we will have some challenges i think in the near future uh regarding new technologies and innovation that um yeah folks need to understand ethics to to deal with for sure i guess in your printer example so throwing away a printer will not be a crime right but still it's not uh, it's not ethical right because the, like it can contaminate the environment right bad things can happen but nobody will put you in jail for that. Right. Sure, yes. If you know that a, a four-year-old is going to be, be exposed to toxic yeah. chemicals when you throw it away, you throw it away. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's not great. Do you maybe have uh, some examples where, like some of the examples where data science was applied, but not ethically to, to these things? Hmm. That's a I good question. Like... Yeah, let me think on that. Maybe I will remember something later. Because yeah. I guess people who who work in these areas, they're maybe they're they think about these issues of ethics uh, more than let's say an average uh, data scientist, perhaps. So maybe these topics of uh, abusing something uh, just to get to make the model right, just these things do not come up. Often. Oh sure. Yeah, actually, yeah, now that I think about it, there's a, I can think of a few examples. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, sure. So um, one thing I think we'll probably come to later um, is, uh, you know, we have new legislation in the EU about AI, the EU AI Act. And so one of the things that it deals, its core method is essentially to assign risk levels to different technologies. And the highest risk level, um, explicitly references this social scoring system in China, which essentially like through all of your goings and, you know, operations in, in society, each thing will give you a score, which will give you more access in society. So for example, if you get a car loan and you pay it on time or you pay it early, 
you might be able to get a visa faster. Um, and so I think the, the consequences of that are actually big. It's, you know, imagine you, you have one situation and your score is damaged and then like your whole family is just, you know, you're second class citizens now. And, you know, it's, uh, so um, I think that's kind of an abuse of, big data and all of these uh, technologies and, and things like that. Um, yeah. Yeah, you were given a, an example from China, but I was thinking, wait a minute, isn't in Germany there is a similar thing called Trufa, which oh. is like actually, <laughs> it's just like you can easily damage this and then nobody will give you credits. Yes, so. Okay. Or maybe it's not as, uh, you know, mm, uh, brought as this system you just described. Sure. But, yeah, I, I, I can understand. So the intention is maybe to make people behave well, right? So pay that, I don't know, do not uh, litter or whatever. But then the consequences could be um, like pretty wide, right? Right. And I think the opportunity for abuse is obviously huge. Mm -hmm. Like maybe you offend one of the maintainers of this database mm -hmm. and then they just give you a zero score and then you can't access anything in in the social sphere um so yeah okay and what is unique uh, when it comes to applications of data science to social impact projects sure so i think um the main difference that i see from being in the social impact space and also working with organizations like Data Science for Social Good and, uh, and similar organizations in the States is that um, it, it's, I think a technical person has to sort of expand um, their thinking uh, because the social issue ultimately will not be solved by this one data science project. And so often the technical solution has to be um, it has to consider uh, the longevity or the bigger picture of this social issue to um, really make it effective. And I think also talking to a lot of non-technical stakeholders, people that honestly like want nothing to do with tech and will not understand um, what you're doing, you need to really understand not only how these organizations work, but how these different, you need to interpret all these different things um, about the specific social issue. So um, I think I, what I observe is a lot of technologists saying like, oh, well, we can solve this issue with one, th or we, here's a project idea. Oh, but will that solve the whole thing? And it's like, nothing on earth will solve this one problem. <laughs> like, yeah, this is like one small part. We have one small goal and, we need to make sure that it lends itself to further iteration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what are the usual people, stakeholders that data scientists working in this domain talk to? Like, are they policymakers? Uh, I don't know. Uh, like, who, who, who are they? Sure. So I think nine times out of 10, they are people very close to the social issue. Um, so, for example, um, Data Science for Social Good, I'll just say DSSG, they had a hackathon um, in December of last year. That's something that they do. And so they had a bunch of NGO stakeholders kind of give data sets, have a very specific problem. And so, um, for example, the German Red Cross was one of the stakeholders um, and they were addressing a hiring issue um, within their organization. And so their stakeholder was like, a hiring manager, like an HR manager. And so um, that person is just, they're very close to all of the challenges and um, you need to sort of mine them for information to create a dynamic solution. So, yeah. Mine for information, so how, how do you do this? <laughs> like you, you have to, like, I guess when you ask questions, so you need to ask them questions uh, to, I don't know, maybe ask them to answer some, uh, I don't know, forms, uh, field some questionnaires, right? Is this how you do this or you just sit and talk? 
Sure. So I think it it takes a lot of proactive effort on your end, and then of course, yeah, you you ask some questions. Um, so I think in this situation, for example, it would have been great if the data analysts like obviously did their exploratory data analysis and did research on the the structure and history of the the Red Cross. Um, so that they could sort of be prepared for what the stakeholder will share. But essentially the stakeholder, like a stakeholder generally has um, very specific challenges that they face um, and they have they don't have a sense of how it can be solved with technology. So um, they really can't help you with, you need, yeah, you really have to go to them with what is their technical system look like in their organization um who manages it um mm -hmm. and things like that and uh, um, like how technically advanced this is is it just an excel spreadsheet or there is an actual database or there's a i don't know website or it's like a, a old school books where you take notes yeah you or know i all of the I, above. yeah all all of the above i've i feel like i've seen everything um i guess that's one of the big challenges that these organizations face is you know, they're donor funded or they have, yeah, they're all, they live on donations. And so a lot of times, like you need to understand that like some staff members are, they're, they're grant fund, they're funded for a temporary amount of time. And like later that person might not be there. So you shouldn't like maybe build your technical plan around that one stakeholder. Um, so yeah, I've seen it, I've seen it all, but I, I unfortunately, I personally have never seen a tech, technically savvy organization. So it's always like a mess. That's my experience. <laughs> um, yeah. Really bad. If you're not an <laughs> IT company, then uh, yeah, you have an organization, but then you realize that you need some sort of IT system quite late in the life of the organization, right? And then we just try to put it somewhere, but it doesn't really fit. Exactly. Then, yeah, that's one of the challenges, I guess, that data scientists need to solve. Like how, okay, now you have a model that detect, detects bots in the ocean, right? Like well, you, you mentioned, like for helping refugees. But so what? Like how, how do you use this now? Like how do you actually help these people who you can detect from this uh, uh, drone, right? Right, absolutely. You know, I think that uh, digital and data literacy is, it's really a challenge everywhere. I think every type of organization that is not a tech company struggles with some level of digital or data literacy. But I think the challenge of a lot of social impact organizations is they don't have the resources to do this type of investment into increasing that digital or data literacy because due to funding, they're so focused on the cause, even if that's at you know, it hinders their efficiency or personal progress. Yeah, there is a question, which book are you referring to? So we were talking about a book that is called Data Science for Public Policy. And I think there is just one book from Springer. I don't think there are multiple books uh, with this title. I think it's just one. Uh, by the way, I think uh, one of the comments you made in the document where we discuss questions, you said that there is another book, another source where can pe where people can learn uh, these things. So which thing is it? Sure, sure. Yes. So I, I have a, a bunch of resources. I think if people want to explore this space, that will be great. But essentially the the source that I recommend for people that want to explore specific applications is actually the Data Science for Social Good Fellowship, um, originally hosted by the University of Chicago. They have an entire page of projects, specific projects. So yes, uh, dssgfellowship.org slash projects. And I, I will put I, the, uh, the link I, in the I comments. I just shared the link right Oh, now. perfect. Thank you. Yes. So it is a list of projects. So what... Uh, we can do with these projects, with this list of projects, which just can go there, check what these projects are about and see what kind of data was used there, what kind of outcome was achieved. Right? Exactly, yes, they have, They most of them have videos where the people involved in the project talk about challenges they face, what they did, um, and there's all types of tech used. So computer vision, predicting text analysis, there's mm -hmm. a great diversity.
Yeah, one of the things I asked you a couple of questions ago was about what's uh, unique about using data science for social impact. Um, and uh, we talked a bit about this and I, I was wondering how difficult it is to get data. Like for example, in this case, like when you have drones flying over the sea, I guess it's not that straightforward, right? To get data here and then actually label use you said that for you as a human, it was difficult to understand which which thing is a boat, where is the boat, right? Right, yes. So yes, this this organization, um, I, I don't want to say their name wrong, um, mm -hmm. so I'll share it in the chat, but they were um, creating their own drones, actually, because they had mm -hmm. to be sort of uh, special or fit their budget or things like that. Um, so yeah, they had to try multiple different, they had to iterate their data pipeline and process to sort that out. And I think the challenge in a lot of social impact spaces is that you, it's a challenge not only to gather data, but um, especially coming from the outside, it's it's really challenging to um, find clean data. There's, it, there's just a lot of gaps, I guess. Um, yeah, so it's it is a challenge to get to get data, um, mm -hmm. even if you're the one gathering it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I guess in a typical IT company, you join a company as a data scientist, and you come and there is a, a database, and you just do select. You join a couple of tables, then maybe one of you of a few features are missing. Maybe data is not the cleanest data on earth, but overall you can do something. Right. But here, in this case, you come and there is nothing, right? There is a problem that needs to be solved. There is no data. There is no infrastructure for, you know, IT infrastructure and just a bunch of people who want to solve this problem. Right, right. exactly. Yeah. Imagine a data scientist building their own drone, like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> you have to build your own drone to gather data. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so a question from Matt, are there models like guidelines, websites, templates for recycling projects that would facilitate the implementation by a small group in the regional community? Hmm. Recycling in a regional community, am I hearing that right? Yeah. Um, man, I think that's, I think there are a few challenges there that have nothing to do with the data science. Um, and I think there's probably a couple ways that you can approach that. Um, so I need a little bit more information. I'm sorry to give such an unsatisfying uh, response, but Matt, if you do want to reach out to me, you know, please do and we are happy to chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But in general, like, is there any public information on recycling projects like the one you mentioned about printer? Mm -hmm for people to read and get inspiration about them? Is there public data about this? Um, I don't know that I'm aware of a public data set about any type of recycling program. I don't know that they keep track of how much they gather, how many people are involved. Um, these numbers might be buried somewhere in a public mm -hmm budget, uh, but they will not, you will only receive like one number. So like mm -hmm. we deployed like 5,000 mm -hmm. cans and you don't mm -hmm. know to where necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I guess like the, the companies, the industry who produces this electronic equipment, they're not super incentivized uh, to make this, all this data publicly available. Right? Because sure. the, yeah, that's because uh, they will have to first it's bad for the image and then, yeah, they will have to do something about this. Right. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Any corporate data will not be public. Yeah. Okay. Um, so a question. So this podcast is great. Thank you. Do you have an idea? This is a question for you. Do you have an idea on what project you would work when you finish your master? Oh man, great question. Is that my professor? Is that my dad? No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> it's anonymous. No. There is yeah. no name. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, great could question. Could be could be either. Could be my dad. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um 
Yeah, you know, this is a great question. And I think uh, this is one of my main goals in, in being in this process. And I'm currently in a fellowship working on a few different areas to see where I think I can be the most effective. The issues that I think not only do I, I, I care about, but I, I think are like the most critical issues of our time are climate justice, um, women's issues like gender equality, just women's issues as a whole, and then um, ethical or responsible technology. Um, and I think there's a lot of ways to address all those things. Obviously, they're huge issues, um, but it would be my hope to uh, find some data science applications to one of those areas for sure and speaking of gender inequality just yesterday we had another conversation and one of the points there was that uh, no, there are just in general uh, females are not encouraged to go to stem uh, to fall uh, you know to go in science uh, some don't like this but in general, the society doesn't encourage them to follow this direction. Is there something we can do, like as uh, as data scientists, let's say, who work for public policy? Is there any policy that can help with this issue? Sure. Yes, I think there's a lot. And I actually saw you yesterday, with Olga. She was really grilling you too. <laughs> yes, I was I like, "What's was... happening? <laughs> <laughs> like, tables are turned." Um, yeah, that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> good. That's good. Yeah, I, I, so I, I think, um, actually one, what I have observed in my understanding is that a lot of times women are not only not encouraged, but they are act actively like prevented from joining this field. Um, so one of my, one of my jobs, I have a manager who is a woman and she wanted to go into STEM, but was actually not allowed to, um, so I think, yeah, on many levels, this needs to change, but I do think like there are ways that we can encourage more transparency because I do think a lot of this like discrimination or subtle like discouragement is, it's really nuanced. You know, it's hard to say like, make that illegal, like don't discourage, like you can't throw yeah, someone that, in that, prison. <laughs> that's what I thought. And it's probably, it happens on the, maybe family level, right? So maybe the dad sure. says, hey, don't do this, right? So go study law or something like this. Right, marry a lawyer. Don't don't study law, marry a lawyer. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. I think these social issues, it's, it's so ingrained. I mean, we really have to all individually do the work to study the lessons our society has taught us. But I do think increasing transparency in this space is one way to sort of change the conversation, right? So for example, in the EU, we have this like corporate social responsibility uh, legislation, which um, one of the things that's not required, but is a value in that space is salary transparency, right? So, um, and I think by requiring organizations to report this information, re report the makeup of their companies, um, this is one way for people to see really clearly of you know, it keeps them accountable for one, but it helps them see really clearly um, what what's happening. Um, and uh, I think there could be more education about like creating safe, safer organizations. Um, and I know y'all talked about like writing job descriptions that, you know, are sort of gender neutral. Um, and there's there's some material out there for that. But mm -hmm. but yeah, these are some ways I think policy could come in or community efforts could come in and try to address that issue. And is it something that you can potentially work as a part of your, uh, was it graduation project or is it part of what you do after the master's? The rest of my life after. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we will have a thesis, uh, sure, like any other graduates uh, master's program. Um, but I definitely hope to. I think that corporate social responsibility really is, um, will be critical to addressing all of those issues. I think cor corporations have such a huge impact now. They have such a huge reach. Um, we really need to require them to be responsible citizens of our world. So um, yeah, and, and legislation will help with that for sure. Mm -hmm. And I imagine then in a project like that, the modeling part will not be the most difficult one. 
So maybe it will be just, you know, fitting a linear regression, but the most difficult part would be like actually getting the data, analyzing the data, preparing the data, right? And then conveying the results in a way that, you know, the problem is clear there, right? Sure, yes. Um, because of this uh, corporate social responsibility CSR initiative in the EU, their data, amount of data in that space is actually growing really rapidly. So I think I think there will be potential for more sophisticated applications in the future. But you're right, I think right now it's somewhat more of a policy issue for sure, social mm -hmm. issue, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what kind of organizations need data scientists who specialize in things like social impact, public, public policy? Is it governments, is it universities, is it somebody else? Sure. Um, well, I will be the annoying person that says every organization <laughs> in the future. Um, and I say this because not only does every nonprofit hopefully have a data person, I think, I honestly think that data science is kind of, if the whole data space, I feel like is kind of evolving towards more of a data person, data persona person. Um, so I think obviously all of those organizations will hopefully have support in analyzing what they have so that they can more efficiently make decisions but i do I be, but every corporation as well has a public policy department which um those people also need to understand the technology and the way that their business relates to technology so yeah i see all the time like public policy at Amazon, public policy at Airbnb. And, you know, these are these are tech companies. They need to understand um, what is happening, the gaps in the AI Act, things like that. So I think in the future, that type of person will be very valuable. Mm -hmm. But right now it's, I know that in the States, uh, there is this position called US Chief Data Scientist. Uh, I think it was, uh, What's the name of that person? DJ Patil, I think. Yes, yes, DJ Patil. Uh, the first, uh, but yeah, he was the first the chief data scientist. Right. I, and I'm wondering what kind of problems they actually solve there, like all these problems we talked about here in this podcast. Sure. You know, I'm actually not too familiar with his tenure um, in the Obama administration. Um, I did follow him quite a bit afterwards. He's very dynamic and is really a huge advocate of the humanities, education, things like that, diverse education for, or backgrounds for data scientists. But um, yeah, I'll need to investigate because I think at that point, um, I think the US does lack a lot of complete open data as well. So I think it's like data science, but maybe just like data at first, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I will investigate. So I guess the idea is like, we already have so many data sets, like now let's hire somebody who can make use of this data. Right, I, th I think it was a savvy choice for Obama to like at least send the message that we want to be a country that values innovation and technology and is proactive about accommodating this. Because I think at that time, um, data science was like the buzzword like it was very foggy as to what data science actually was. So I think at that point it was more of a, like, I don't know. Marketing? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Sending the message, politicking, I don't know. I will investigate though now, this is a great question. Okay, and uh, yeah, let's say somebody is interested in uh, learning about this and working in uh, with data science, making social impact and make the difference with data skills, with their data skills. So what do they need to get started? Sure, well, I would just congratulate that person and really just encourage them to keep pursuing that. But I think I would recommend two things. So um, I think not only is Data Science for Social Good uh, an excellent organization, but this is kind of a global organization as well. So if you're not able to join, if you don't have a local Data Science for Social Good, um, group, um, there are ones that you can volunteer remotely. So I think if you feel ready to dive right in, this is a great way for you to learn from folks that have been doing this, get exposure to social issues and things like that. 
but I think the second thing is I would really encourage you to um, see if you have a particular issue that resonates with you and really start your research and um, understanding the current landscape of that issue. So for example, I think um, we have the sustainable development goals cre created by the UN um, and that lists out very clear, specific social issues and goals that I think if you read through those, find something that resonates with you and do a little research, a lot of those, because they were presented um, almost a while ago, there, there's beginning to be more data for each of those specific social issues. So you could get far on your own if you, if you do have a cause in mind. Mm -hmm. Is there a list somewhere? Because I know that there is data science for social good Berlin. I guess there is like a data science for social good Germany. Then there is one in Portugal. There is one in Poland. Uh, uh, so we have quite a few organizations. And then the, there is uh, Omdena. I think they're also doing... Uh, do you know Omdena? I actually don't. There, there are others, but I have not heard of this uh, one. I think they are doing like a... They, also get some projects and then they get data scientists who want to get experience so they kind of coach them and let them work on their data skills so there are quite a few of them it's quite um, i want to say decentralized i don't know for the lack of a better word so what i'm trying to ask is is there a place where maybe all these problems are listed and then instead of you know your geographical uh, area you go to Berlin data science for social good Berlin maybe instead of that you can see a list and think okay this problem really resonates with me I want to work on that one would you say like um, a list of local issues or oh, for something? example like or list of issues that might need some sort of like a job posting or job board with like uh, this kind of problems where help is needed you know, there actually is. Um, so this was another resource I wanted to, to share with folks walk, watching. So there's an excellent organization. Um, uh, I think they're called 80,000 Hours, but essentially their mission is to help people um, effectively create impact. Uh, so they do have a job board and they do rank jobs based on how critical that issue is to like, like saving the world basically like what what's the greatest risk to humanity um and they will rank all the issues and organizations affiliated with that those issues um in that order so that's an i i will put a link to that organization also in the comments yeah i'm looking this up right now so it's actually a london-based nonprofit organization and they have their own wikipedia page which says they're pretty serious they're legit. Uh, yes yeah yeah and yeah, the, the link is like a, uh, do you know wh why this name? 80,000 hours, yes. So I think yeah. um, this is how long the average person spends in their career. So mm -hmm. if you want to, you know, that's quite a long time if you think about it and you can make a meaningful difference with that time instead of just, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so this is a way of encouraging people to spend all these hours on making the impact instead of you know, bringing revenue to yet another, uh, uh, what I'm trying to say, like a uh, corporation. So list, no, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, I, I had this word in mind. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. We won't, we won't say that or we won't go there, but, but actually they're quite a savvy organization there. They're quite educational. So I think there are many ways for people to make their, um, career have a huge impact. So for example, um, I know they give uh, like this Google engineer who loves his job at Google um, and he do, he makes a pledge to donate like 20% of his income for the rest of his life, um, for the rest of his like 80,000 hours. And so, um, and there's other things that they, they provide many different options um, there and they, they give quite a lot of education as to why this is impactful or, or what's meaningful, how to make a choice. So it's, um, yeah, they're quite dynamic. So I, uh, I'm quite interested in learning a, a bit about other use cases. So maybe from your experience, or maybe now you're uh, learning this with other students, with your classmates, what kind of problems you see that they solve or you see in general that are being solved right now with data science? 
Yeah. So I think in my program right now, we're more so um, diving into like the deep end in both of these topics um, and have not yet had much of an opportunity to bring them together. Um, so I know I did a, I, we had um, some group projects, for example, that addressed um, uh, a lack of census data. So I worked with a group, um, we use satellite imagery to try to predict poverty levels, which is an incomplete project, but essentially there are some countries that don't have a census. Um, Afghanistan is one of them. So it would be really helpful to have estimations of what what poverty looks like in these countries so that you know aid or support can be accurately you know given um, and yeah of course we use computer vision for analyzing the satellite images um, but yes this it's like an incomplete project but it's i guess one one way you can sort of combine those issues mm -hmm. interesting and uh, I guess as a part of census, I don't remember last time somebody actually asked me these questions. I think it was like 15 years ago. I don't remember what kind. I, they asked me my nationality, what I do. Uh, and I think that was pretty much it. So I don't know. Like even though I was a part of census, I don't know how much the useful information they actually learned about me, apart from me being uh, me, or you know, me having my nationality. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> um, anything else uh, that come to to your mind? Maybe some other problem. Um. Yeah. Nothing comes to mind right now. But I do actually want to pitch one thing that if you want to explore the space, um, so. I moderate an open coffee club that focuses on ethics in AI. Um, the goal is to democratize this conversation. Um, so every week or every other week, every meeting, every other week we have a different uh, ethical challenge in this space. So it's just, it's just a one hour like casual coffee chat. Um, start your day with an existential crisis. No, <laughs> a challenge for human race. So what was the last challenge on your last uh, meeting? Yeah, so we actually met um, yesterday morning um, and we talked about Lambda, the Google chatbot, which uh, people are debating whether it's sentient or not, um, and maybe the potential consequences of the response or just the, the situation. So it was interesting conversation. I haven't never heard about Lambda. I heard about a bot from Microsoft that uh, went, uh, it became racist pretty quickly. Uh, like it's starting, it, like because it was trained on data from Twitter, so people in Twitter would, you know, teach the bot. And then, of course, uh, this is what happened. If you just uh, <laughs> uh, let people do this without controlling. Okay, interesting. Yeah. I, I should uh, look it up. Okay, well, if somebody wants to reach out to you, what's the best way to do this? Sure. So I'm I'm on Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, I do have a website with an email newsletter. You can try to contact or sign up. Um, but yes, I think these are the main ways: Twitter, LinkedIn, and ChristineSepalak.com. So. so that's first name, last name. dot com, and then you yes. have a newsletter there. Okay, yes. we will make sure to include all these links in the description under the video. Um, yeah, I guess that's it for today. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us today. Thanks a lot Thank for you. sharing uh, your experience, uh, the stories with us, all these problems. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> no one have a crisis. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> Shona Bend, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>